Hello, this is Biology 101, and today we'll be talking about cell structure and function. You've probably learned by now what a cell is in science class. Just in case you forgot, cells are the smallest unit of life, function as the basic structural and functional unit of all living organisms, and new cells are created from the division of old cells. The cells that you know and love are classified into two categories, prokaryotic cells, which include archaea and bacteria, and eukaryotic cells, which include animal and plant cells, fungi, and protists. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have a few similarities such as having DNA which holds hereditary information, and the fact that they share some structures including the cytoplasm, ribosomes, and a cytoskeleton. Now you may be asking yourself, what's the point of having these structures in the first place? Part of the reason is because having structures such as a membrane or a cytoplasm creates microenvironments which provide the necessary conditions and the surface area that maximize the cell's functional efficiency. Now we can see this happening when we look at these structures a little bit more closely. Starting with the cell membrane. The cell membrane, or the plasma membrane, is made up of a phospholipid bilayer and forms a boundary separating the internal cellular space from the external environment. The phospholipid bilayer consists of hydrophilic heads, which like to interact with water, and hydrophobic tails, which don't like to interact with water. This unique property makes the cell membrane selectively permeable, meaning that some substances, such as small nonpolar molecules, are able to pass through the cell membrane easily, while other substances, such as large polar molecules, tend to struggle to pass through by themselves. Once you pass through the cell membrane, you'll encounter a structure known as the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the gel-like fluid made up of organic and inorganic substances which fills the internal space of the cell enclosed by the cell membrane. The cytoplasm provides the environment necessary for crucial chemical reactions to occur that ensure the cell's function. In eukaryotic cells, the cytoplasm encapsulates various organelles which we'll be talking about later in this video. Ribosomes are complexes composed of ribosomal DNA and proteins, which are responsible for protein synthesis. You'll generally find these structures floating around in the cytoplasm. Finally, the cytoskeleton is a network of fibers which extends throughout the cytoplasm and functions by helping the cell maintain its shape by providing mechanical support. The cytoskeleton is composed of various subcomponents, including microtubules, which are made up of tubulin polymers and help facilitate cell movements and transport within the cell, microfilaments that are made of actin filaments and enable cell motility, contraction, and intracellular transport, and intermediate filaments which provide mechanical support to the plasma membrane and for other tubulin structures. Now while eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells share many features, the two groups are also quite distinct. The main difference between the two lies in the fact that eukaryotes have a substructure within them known as the nucleus, and membrane-bound organelles that allow them to increase their functionality and provide sites for more biochemical reactions, while prokaryotic cells do not. So let's look into the organelles that make eukaryotic cells unique, starting with the nucleus. The nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle found in eukaryotic cells and is known as the cell's center for its genetic material. The nucleus is crucial for life as the genetic material within it encodes the cell's activity and functions. The nucleus is composed of various subcomponents. For instance, the nuclear envelope is a double membrane bound structure that encloses the cell nucleus. The nuclear envelope serves as a selectively permeable barrier that separates the contents of the nucleus from the rest of the cell. It also includes an array of small holes or pores that permit the free movement of molecules such as nucleic acids and proteins between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The nucleoplasm is a viscous material 
composed primarily of cytosol, which forms the nucleus's matrix, and holds several non-membrane-bound substructures within the nucleus in place. The isolated environment of the nucleoplasm allows for controlled transcription and gene regulation to occur. The chromosomes are organized packages of DNA found in the nucleus. These chromosomes contain the elements necessary for processes such as replication. Finally, the nucleolus is a small spherical body located within the nucleus, which is responsible for synthesizing RNA and assembling the cell's ribosomes. Overall, the nucleus as a structure is evolutionarily advantageous because it encases the DNA, thus providing extra protection and decreasing the likelihood of mutation. The nucleus is connected to another structure called the endoplasmic reticulum through intermediate filaments, which we mentioned before, which have the function of mechanical support. The endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle consisting of a network of membranous tubules within the cytoplasm, which serves several functions including protein synthesis, lipid metabolism, and calcium storage. The endoplasmic reticulum consists of two subunits, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which has ribosomes on its surface and aids in the synthesis and folding of secretory proteins, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is responsible for synthesizing lipids, breaking down carbohydrates, and regulating calcium ion levels. Sometimes, the proteins produced in the rough endoplasmic reticulum will remain there, while other proteins are transported to other structures within the cell, such as the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus, or Golgi complex, is an organelle composed of flattened membrane sacs. Now, the Golgi apparatus is known as the mailing center of the cell. It functions by receiving small membrane sacs or vesicles from other organelles such as the endoplasmic reticulum, containing substances such as proteins, which are then modified and transported in new vesicles from the complex. These vesicles will either travel to the cell membrane releasing their contents, or travel to other organelles such as the lysosome. The lysosome is a membrane-bound organelle with an acidic environment and enzymes that degrade, the that degrade cellular waste, such as dysfunctional proteins transported from the Golgi body, or recycle damaged organelles. You can think of the lysosome as the recycling bin of the cell. Any used up or damaged material brought to the lysosome is broken down into parts which can be reused for the synthesis of other substances. Now, all these processes are wonderful and all, but they need a source of energy to continue functioning. And that brings us to the mitochondria. Mitochondria are double membrane bound organelles with inner membrane foldings called cristae. Mitochondria are responsible for cellular respiration, which is a metabolic process where oxygen is used to generate ATP, an energy carrying organic molecule which is responsible for driving cellular activity. Now, there are a few types of substructures that only exist within certain types of eukaryotic cells. For instance, the chloroplast is another double membrane bound organelle found in plant cells whose various subcomponents allow it to undergo multiple metabolic processes. These subcomponents include the thylakoid, which is made up of organized stacks of grana where light dependent reactions of photosynthesis occur. The stroma, which is the fluid in the inner membrane of the chloroplast, which is responsible for light-independent processes such as the carbon fixation cycle, and the membrane, which forms the outer layers of the chloroplast, which facilitates the electron transport chain. Plants also have a unique vacuole, which is considered the central storage unit of the cell. Typically, in an animal cell, you'll find that vacuoles are small and have functions such as storage, excretion, osmoregulation, and digestion. However, in plants and fungi, the vacuoles, referred to as the central vacuole, are significantly larger. This is because animal cells use most of their energy on metabolic activities, therefore spending less energy on their vacuoles. Now this makes sense, since animals move around significantly more than plants do to get their food. Now specifically in plants, the central vacuole is responsible for holding material and waste. 
but it also exerts what we call turgor pressure on the walls of the cell to maintain its shape and structure. Finally, plant cells have a cell wall, which is a rigid layer composed of cellulose and other polysaccharides. It is the outermost layer of a plant cell and is used to maintain the cell shape and protect it from mechanical damage. So what did we learn in this video? First, we covered the basics of the cell. We know that the cell is the smallest unit of life, functions as the basic structural and functional unit of all living organisms, and new cells are created from the division of old cells. Next, we learned that there are two types of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, which share features such as the cytoplasm, membrane, ribosomes, and a cytoskeleton, but they also have plenty of differences in the fact that eukaryotic cells have organelles such as the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, the lysosome, and the mitochondria. Finally, we learned that there are a few types of structures that only exist within certain types of eukaryotic cells, including chloroplasts, central vacuoles, and cell walls, which plant cells have but animal cells do not have.